I'm doing Ephesians 4, 17 to 24, and let's start by reading that passage together. And uh, Lucas was, Lucas was uh, trying out the uh, CSB. I'm trying out the Darby translation. Jo- John Nemo tr- kind of turned me on to the Darby translation for this passage, and so I'm going to go with that. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye should no longer walk as the rest of the nations walk in the vanity of their mind, being darkened in understanding, estranged from the life of God by reason of the ignorance which is in them, by reason of the hardness of their hearts, who, having cast off all feeling, have given themselves up to lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greedy, unsatisfied lust. But ye have not thus learnt the Christ, if ye have heard him and been instructed in him according to the truth is in Jesus. Namely, you're having put off, according to the former conversation, the old man which corrupts itself according to the deceitful lusts, and being renewed in the spirit of your mind. And you're having put on the new man, which according to God is created in truthfulness, truthful righteousness and holiness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we need your word this morning. We need your word to cut off all the garbage that we just learned during the week from the world. We need your word to feed us this morning, to bring conviction of sin, to bring new perspective on our life, to renew our minds, Lord. We need you to speak to us this morning. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, I want to say again, I'm just so proud of how everything is going. All the speakers are so good. I wish uh, I I wasn't following Steve Thurman, though. I really (laughs) wish that was not happening. Uh, Three years ago, I think three or four years ago, we were at we were at the Riley Center, and I did not know I didn't I didn't know. uh, Steve back then, but after I gave a talk, he, he pulled me aside. He said, Sean, I just want to talk to you for just a minute. And he pulled me aside and he said, he said, I want to encourage you. You have the gift of teaching and I want you, I want to encourage you to develop that gift. And, um, after, after this session, I'm pretty sure he's going to pull me aside and say, the gift has been withdrawn. <laughs> just, just stop while you're ahead, Sean. Um, Actually, after that talk, I, I got ordained. I was, it was the word I needed to hear, and I got ordained quickly after, and I became an associate pastor of a church. So thank you, Steve, for that. Uh, but it's only been trouble ever since then. So you have much to answer for. We're talking about Ephesians 4, 17 to 24. And I've, I've kind of played with the title. I'm not quite sure. I'm going with Be Renewed. Um, so you all know I was born a Canadian citizen. Woohoo! Actually, if you're a real Canadian, if you're a real Canadian, though, I'm from Quebec. So when I tell Americans I'm Canadian, that makes sense. But when I tell Canadians I'm from Quebec, they understand that that's not. It's kind of like being from Guam a little bit. You're American, but it's just a little bit different. <laughs> Quebec is just it's its own thing. And uh, I, I, if, you, if you don't believe in government social engineering, you should have been raised in Quebec because there was no, I, my Canadian identity in Quebec was not at all impressed upon me. I had no documentation saying that I was Canadian in any way, shape, or form. Quebec wanted to and still wants to be its own country. And so all of my documentation as a kid, my birth certificate, driver's license, health care cards, edu- all the education stuff... No mention of Canada, only mentions of Quebec. No Canadian flags, just Quebec flags, all that stuff. And so they were socially engineering us to not think of ourselves as Canadian, but as uh, Quebecois, so that we would support separation. And as a result, I think basically 90% of the kids in my year, I kind of grew up in an English area of Montreal, 90% of us, we just left Quebec. So the social engineering worked, we all left. (laughs) You know, and so now I went back home uh, in January, and it's like a, it's a completely different place. It used to be a middle class English neighborhood called the West Island, and now it's just some, something completely different. So I am Canadian, but I never really had that sense of being Canadian. And one of my proudest moments was in, in November, November twenty fifth, two thousand and thirteen, when I became a U.S. citizen. And I'm so thankful for that. I really am. 
I really am. Because I really, after kind of growing up in a, in a, a very socialized, very government intensive, I believe in a, I believe the two most ancient, well, two of the most ancient religions in the world is our uh, worship of nature, which I think is on the rise again in our day. And I think the other thing is worship of, of the state as God. When you, don't, when you don't worship the true God, you worship the person with the gun, you know. And so, you, so a lot of people just look to the state for everything in life, from, from cradle to the grave. They, they really worship the state functionally instead of worshiping God. So I really believe in the, the founding principles of this country, limited government, extremely limited government. But don't get me started. Personal freedom... <laughs> But also barbecue. I did not grow up with barbecue. I love barbecue. It's the greatest thing. Was that, was that good last night? Was the meal good last night? That's one of the things we try to improve. Because last year, the whole dinner situation wasn't so great. And you guys let us know in your evaluations. In no uncertain terms. So we tried to improve that last night. Did we get it, did we get it a little bit better? Yeah. yeah, a little bit better. So I'm still kind of having my Americanism, though, my, that American identity kind of just tra- you know, transform my mentality. All right? My accent is, can you still tell I have a Canadian accent sometimes? sometimes oh, oh, really? A lot? Really? Man. Not if I was in Vermont, though. I think if I was in the Northeast, I'd be a little more. But uh, there are some ways that I still have, I'm still catching up. I still have a long way to go to be fully American. Uh, I still don't own a gun. I don't own a pickup. I don't have cowboy boots. I don't listen to country music. I don't have anything by George Strait. And Josh Meyer says, I can't even be a Texan. I should just leave because I don't listen to George Strait. And I don't watch football. I've seen one football game in my life. Uh, Yeah, exactly. I have a long way to go for my corporate identity to transform my mentality. Um... My neighbor, I have two neighbors there, both ex, uh, the father's an ex-Marine, the son is an ex-Marine, and they're like, you need, <laughs> they're like, uh, we will take you, actually the son, the son manages a gun range, and they're like, we will, look, come with us, and we will save you, and we'll teach you how to be a man, and to protect your family, and the guy I cro- I live in a little cul-de-sac, and the other guy is a retired uh, cop from Miami, and he's like, Sean here, just I'll just take you to the gun store and we'll just pick out a revolver together and I'll show you how to use it. And I believe in the Second Amendment, but I, I'm still, you know, that Canadianness in me is like, okay, I don't know. Now, by contrast, I have a son. His name's Zane. He's four years old. He's turning five next week. He was born here. He owns a pair of cowboy, all my kids do, cowboy boots. And he wears cowboy boots with his underwear. <laughs> That's how Texas he is. And you're lucky if he has underwear on. Um, He has this mobile oil hat. We were getting the oil changed, and he was just so interested in what the guys were doing. And they just saw that he was just, wow, this is so cool. And they just gave him a mobile oil hat. And so he just wears this mobile oil hat with his cowboy boots and his underwear. And that's pretty American, I think. That's pretty American. We were, uh, it's about time that we're going to have to probably buy a new vehicle. And we were just looking online. And uh, I was just looking at different, you know, dreaming about what car to buy. Now, in my heart of hearts, I'm going to disappoint you. In my heart of hearts, I would buy a Prius or a Chevy Volt. I know. I know. That's the Canadian in me. I want to, I believe in the environment. You know, we have one and we should take care of it. But okay. Now, my son, on the other hand... He was like, I was like, what kind of car do you want when you grew up, Zane? And he was like, he was like, picked out a pickup truck. And he was like, oh, that's a, that's a cool pickup truck. And uh, I showed him some new ones. And he was like, no, no, he didn't like the new ones. He, he picked out one that was like from the 80s. And he was like, oh, I want that pickup truck. And then, I, and then he saw one with big tires. And he's like, oh, I want the one with the big tires. And then he saw one with bigger tires. And he, oh, he want that one. Finally, he settled on, he wants to get this pickup truck. <laughs> And uh, he asked me if he could have a gun rack. And I said, I, said I, I, I think so from watching films and TV. I think you can't have a gun rack in your truck. And I was like, why would you want that? And he said, so I can drive in the mud and shoot animals. And so I have this picture of Zane in his underwear wearing cowboy boots, 
driving this pickup truck shooting animals. And uh, I don't know if there's beer in there or not. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I confessed to a friend, uh, I think my son is, is a redneck. And they said, I got news for you. Uh, I, I said, I, thought, I think he might become a redneck. And they said, I got news for you. He's, al- he's already a redneck. <laughs> and I just wondered if rednecks are four-year-olds with paychecks is what I was wondering. So my son's corporate identity is really influencing his mentality already. And um, I'm finding this about Texas. This is, John Steinbeck didn't mean this as a, as a good thing, but he said, Texas is a state of mind. Texas is an obsession. Above all, Texas is a nation in every sense of the word. And there's an opening, uh, what is that? I don't know. There's an opening con- convey of generalities. A Texan outside of Texas is a foreigner. Amen. Is that true? <laughs> I think that's true. <laughs> When I meet, you know, when, 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 when Americans visit Europe, most of them, and if someone asks, where are you from? Most of them say, I'm American, but what do Texans say? I'm from, where are you from? I'm from Texas. They don't say I'm from the U.S. I'm from Texas. Um, so how does your corporate identity affect your living? And I, did I waste enough time? Do I have like 10 minutes left to rush through? You were just so enthralled you weren't keeping track. Okay. That's good. No, no. Okay. Okay, I'm not looking. That's the problem. Okay. How does your corporate identity affect your living? Paul says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. The therefore goes back to verse, uh, verse 1 in chapter 4. I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. People say, what do, what do people complain? When they, when, they, when, you, when they hear the grace message, what do they complain this will lead to? Sinful living, right? License. And they say, if you preach this grace stuff, people are just going to run all over and they're going to do whatever they want. And the truth is they're already doing whatever they want, right? But I always tell them, I, I don't know if you've read Zane's commentary on, on, on Romans or on James or on First John. But I believe that as a movement, as a free grace movement, and I'm thinking, I'm always thinking about how do we shape this movement? How do we, how do we go forward? I always think to myself, as a free grace movement, I think we emphasize, we should emphasize real experiential holiness. Real holiness in the way we live, walk, talk, and think. I think that's what Paul is saying here. You should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Walk means it's your way of living. We shouldn't be walking the way the rest of the Gentiles walk. We should be different. Grace should transform us. Um, I, forget the, I forget the verse. I, I believe it's in Titus. But, but grace teaches us to be holy. Law doesn't teach you to be holy. Law sets up a standard that will only provoke you to sin and that you fall from and that you will never meet up and it frustrates you and it just makes you focus more on law, which is basically, in Paul's terminology, focusing on the flesh and that just produces more sin because that's what the law was designed to do. It was never designed to make you holy. It was designed to reveal your sin to you. But grace is supposed to provoke you or inspire you to real experiential holiness. Not just positional holiness, that's very important. But as believers, we're supposed to be actually holy. That's one of the biggest struggles that I've had as, a, as an associate pastor. Is just teaching people and to, to, to see how their lives should be different from the culture around us. What's so bad about Gentile living? minutes oh my God. in the futility of their mind having their understanding darkened being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling let me summarize that for you let me break it down for you the Gentiles are spiritually degenerate they're alienated from the life of God they're mentally degenerate ignorance and blindness they're emotionally degenerate they're past feeling and they're overtly degenerate. They're, they've given themselves over. One of the interesting things that I find is that uh, um, in the free grace movement, we have to rethink all five points of Calvinism. And, and it all begins with T, right? What does T stand for? Total depravity. 
And on one sense, that's absolutely true. Sin affects every single area of our life. Our thinking, our feeling, our behavior, the way we speak, it affects everything. But according to Calvinists, total depravity means something else. It means total what? Inability. Man, you guys are smart. Um, but the Bible doesn't really, I don't, I don't think, the Bible doesn't really kind of reflect that Gentiles really are totally unable. If, if Gentiles were totally unable, why would God have to harden Pharaoh's heart? His heart would have already been hardened. If, if, if the Gentiles were totally unable, why would Satan have to come? And, and you know the parable of the four soils. Why would he have to come and pluck those seeds away lest they believe and be saved? He wouldn't need to do anything. <laughs> because they're totally unable. Why would Paul be complaining about the Gentiles being spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and overtly degenerate? If it was just a given that everyone's just born this way. The Gentile world, and I think about the world around us, I don't know if you see it in the culture around us, but I feel like I'm, as I'm raising kids and as I'm kind of pastoring some people at, at this church, and, and I really feel the burden that, man, the world is like this tidal wave, and it's just, just ready to just sweep us along with its immorality, you know? My wife and I, we used to have a TV. One of the kids broke it, and we, and we decided to just leave it broken. So it's kind of a testimony to, to, to what we used to have. Um, but we really try to limit now TV shows and movies because what's on, what is on is crazy. I remember there was an episode of The Simpsons like from like 20 years ago, and they were imagining all the kids grown up and... Homer and Marge are sitting on the couch and they're, and they're watching something and you don't see what they're watching. You just hear the noises and you can tell that they're watching something extremely lewd. And then Marge turns to Homer and she says, I don't really remember Fox becoming a, uh, I, don't know, I, I don't know if I should say it in public, but I don't remember Fox becoming a hardcore porn channel. But that's, and it's, it was a joke 20 years ago, but it's not really funny now. Uh, we used to watch TV every night. You know, we have about one hour together at the end of the day after putting the kids to bed. And we, we used to watch. But we, we, have, we have had to stop watching <laughs> dozens of TV shows because <laughs> they're so lewd because they celebrate so much immorality. Now we just watch like, um, uh, like black and white shows from the 50s or British mysteries because the culture is just so degenerate. And we are, we're realizing now that, wow, this is a huge influence on us and we need to um, keep ourselves from it. And now what's the problem with the Gentiles? The root problem is, look at these terms, mind, understanding, ignorance, blindness of heart, past feeling. What's the root problem? I think the root problem, if you'll, uh, I wonder if you'll agree with me, is they have a corrupt mentality. It begins with the mind. And there's a war going on for the mind. And it's kind of interesting. We are moral creatures. God created us as moral creatures. And so the way that Satan gets to us is by influencing our minds. When Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, he couldn't force Jesus to do anything. What he tried to do was he tried to lie and misuse scripture to influence Jesus to uh, worship him and, and to commit idolatry. And, and how did Jesus answer Satan? With what? With scripture, right? Adam and Eve in the garden. God gave Adam and Eve a command. He gave them information to their minds. He explained the consequences of their actions if they ate from the tree, the knowledge of good and evil. And then Satan came along and did he force Eve to eat the apple? Or not the apple, but the fruit? No, what did he do? He tried to influence her by attacking her mind with lies and uh, corrupting God's word and putting doubts in her mind about God's word. And we need to understand that in our culture, the Gentile, what was that? (laughs) There's a war for the mind going on. Now that I have little kids, I am extremely aware, even more aware of the war that's going on for their minds. And I have to, we have to, we have to police what they watch all the time because so much of what they watch is just, some of it's just nonsense. Some, we say that's making you dumber. So turn that off. And so they'll say, they'll say to their friends, I'm not allowed watching that. That makes me dumber. And so... (laughs) So so we're trying to lead them on the right path there. 
But what's the practical result of having a sinful mentality? You give yourself over to these, these are all kind of sexual terms basically that Paul's using. You give yourself over to these lewd behaviors. Uh, in Romans chapter 1, what is the judgment that God says will befall a nation when they exchange a truth for a lie? Does God say he's going to send locusts? Does God say he's going to send war? Nope. Does God say he'll send economic collapse as a judgment? Nope. What is the judgment? What's the punishment for a culture that rejects the truth in exchange for a lie? God turns them over to what? Depravity. In particular, homosexuality. When I was a kid, I didn't even know what that is. And now... I wonder if the whole nation is under a Romans 1 judgment. I'm proud to be American, but I also tremble to be American. If you don't think we're under that judgment, just think about what, what was true 20 years ago and what is true today. I was talking to a mother last night. At 10 o'clock last night, she contacted me, and her son got married to a dude. And they both profess to be believers in the Dallas area, and they want to go to a Bible church. Not a liberal church. They want to go to a Bible church. But no one will accept them. And she, she knows that's a problem, but she was like, what do I do about that? And I'm torn about what to do. On the one hand, there has to be some type of church discipline. Thing. On one hand, there has to be some type of biblical separation. But on the other hand, I really, really, really want to love these two guys. When you have a sinful mentality... You give yourself over to lewdness. And Paul says, well, you guys were taught better than that. Verse 20 to 21. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. The, gent, uh, the, the believers, the Ephesians, should have been different because they knew better. They had learned better. Their minds should have been transformed by the word of God. What's the steps here? First, the truth is taught. Then the truth is heard. And then the truth is learned. What I'm, what I'm learning as a pastor is you can't just say the truth once and expect it to stick. You have to say it. Dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of times I taught through John and by the end of a year, and you know how obsessive we are about eternal life. At the end of the year, they're like, so if I believe, I get eternal life. It's like, yes, you just heard it for 50, you know, 50 plus Sundays, me saying it dozens and dozens of times, but they finally got it. I think for us to be holy, to truly be holy, we need to come to conferences like this and attend Bible churches where we're hearing the truth again and again and again and again. Because just because it's taught doesn't mean it's heard. And just because it's heard doesn't mean it has been learned. Bob knows that very well about me. He's had the same conversations with me over and over again. And I'm finally catching on sometimes. Now this next section, I, wrote, I thought I wrote something brilliant and I sent it to Nimala and he said, no, no. <laughs> No, no. I thought this next section was about putting on like your new nature. I thought it was like Ephesians 3, uh, 316. He's, I thought Paul was talking about the inner man. And I thought it was a, uh, a, a command, five minutes, I thought it was a command that we should put on this inner man. And Nemo was like, no, no. And he set me straight. That's why I love you. Are you moving to DFW? You're supposed to you keep on, you know, is your son moving here? I need you to move here so you can teach me. Or I could do that. <laughs> Please, I would love to. Can I get out of North Texas? Um, the truth is, Paul here is actually, and that's why Nimla kind of turned me on to this Darby translation. Paul is talking about something that has already happened to the believers. It's something having put off. It's in the uh, aorist middle. It's something that has happened to them. Having put off. They've already put off something called the old man. I thought this was kind of like the Roman 7 flesh. It's not the flesh. All of this conference we've been emphasizing that Ephesians emphasizes a C word. What's the C word? Corporate. I didn't get that. 
Nemo straightened me out. Having put off the former conversation in the old man. And I love this translation, old man, because it keeps the Bible weird. Sometimes you just need to keep the Bible weird. One of the speakers said that, uh, I'll get to that in a second. So the old man is our old Adamic relationship. And we need to, that has been put off. We're no longer in that relationship. Instead, having put on the new man, all these, a lot of translations say new self, new humanity, new people. And those are all wrong because they give it, uh, one of the speakers earlier had said, you know, God creates a new race of people. And that might be true. We're not Gentiles, we're not Jews, but we're a new race of people. And that might be true in other verses, but I don't think that's true in this verse. We're not a new race of people in this verse. What are we? We're a new man. We're part of a body. It's a, this is a weird illustration. New people, a new nation, that makes sense. A new race of people, that makes sense to us. But Paul is way more radical than that. It's not that we're not Gentiles and we're not Jews anymore, we're, we're, but we're some third people. We're actually part of a new man. We're part of Christ. We're in Christ which according to God is created in truthful righteousness and holiness. I have a quote here from Honer, and I'll just skip that. Gabeline. Do you guys have Gabeline's concise commentary? If you don't, you should should have it. Let me read this for you. The old man is put off, and the new man is put on. We're not told to put off the old man by all kinds of endeavors and resolutions. Paul's going to have a bunch of imperatives for us later, and David Jansen's going to talk about that. It's already done. This is still a corporate emphasis. The old man was put away by the cross of Christ. This is the blessed truth which we delivers from doubt and bondage. And then we receive something in Christ, the new man, the new... See, he says new nature. No. No. Grace, we receive this new corporate identity in Christ. And this new man after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, which calls for a corresponding walk. So it's not the flesh. This is not the, uh, what is the old man? It's not the flesh. It's this old identity. Uh, the, the flesh is something else. It's the old Adamic ad- identity. What's the new man? It's not the born again nature. Paul has a lot to say about that. The new man is really Christ himself. And we know that from Ephesians two fourteen to 16. The only other use of the, the, the new man in this book. And from there, it's very clear that the one new man is Christ. The one body. When did this happen to you? Objectively, it happened at the cross. Our old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So there's a connection there between the old man and the body of sin. But subjectively, it became true to you of you at the point of faith. And this is not an imperative for you. It's in the aorist. But... What's in the present tense is the corruption of the old man and the renewal of your mind. So this is kind of where, where, where some, this is very individual. The old man is corporate. The old Adamic nature is always corrupting itself. That's in the present tense. Just look at the culture around you. Just turn on the TV or watch a movie and you'll see that the old man is still corrupting itself in new and astounding and pernicious ways. But you need to be what? You need to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And this is kind of really interesting. I loved Lucas's presentation yesterday because this is all part of the Bible's weirdness. What are we really? Um, the Holy Spirit is working on your human spirit to influence your mind. We know that, this, we know that the mind and the spirit are distinct from 1 Corinthians 14, 14. My spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So apparently the Holy Spirit uses Bible teaching to work on the born-again human spirit to then influence the mind. I think that's very, you know, the Bible's weird and we need to keep it weird. How much time do I have left? Am I done? Am I done? Zero? I have time. Let me just let me just end with this. Well, I'm not going to end with that. Um, I appreciate the pastors here, and I so so I thank God for you because your jobs are so hard to preach the truth again and again and again, and to be consistent again and again and again. Um, I thank you that you're using your gift because we need you. I thank you for the speakers who spoke at this conference because we need you. We need that truth because the forces of this culture are so trying to drag us into uncleanliness and lewdness and to just make us totally ineffective in our Christian lives and turn us into carnal Christians. And we need truth. We need conferences like this. We need Bible-believing churches to teach the truth so that people can have their minds renewed and walk truly holy lives for the glory of Christ. If you have been thinking that there's no free grace church in your area, 
and the Lord has been putting it on your heart to start one, I want to encourage you to take that step of faith. Because you might be the only voice of grace and, and the only voice of authentic holiness within hundreds of miles. I want you to, to kind of investigate your own heart to know, do I have the gift to do that? And to step out in faith to exercise that gift. Because the world needs the word of God, not only to be born again, but to be holy. And isn't that what we all want to do? To serve and please the Lord with every aspect of our life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your words that renew our minds. That help us to grow, that help us to mature that help us to serve the body and participate in the body so that we can reach the world, not only with your saving message, but with your discipleship message, your growing message, your message of abiding life, your message of holiness. I pray, Lord, that you would use every single person in this room as salt in this world to preserve it for a little bit longer. But I also pray, Lord, that you would come soon. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, how would you solve the problem of ministering to openly stated homosexuals that definitely profess their belief in Christ? That was the question last night. And uh, so first of all, I want to say to anyone listening, uh, being homosexual is not an issue to being born again. Sin is not the problem. There are probably people who have told you, and I, someone might be listening to this online, there are probably people who have told you that God doesn't love you. That is not true. God loves you. And there are people who say, you need to give that up before you can get eternal life. That's not true. It's by simply believing. So to the transsexual, to the homosexual, to all the isms, God loves you and you can have eternal life by simply believing in Jesus. But how do you minister to those people? You minister to them by being their friend and by loving them. The question is, what happens during the meeting of the church? And that's what I've been struggling with because I'm, I'm, I'm in a Baptist church. And there's a, just a bunch of tradition that is not amenable to church discipline and to growing people in that way. And um, I've been reading a lot about Bob Bryant's stuff, and I really appreciate that. And talking to Bob, they have very strong opinions about the meeting of the church and the discipline that should be exercised there. I know at Victor Street, I used to go to Victor Street when I lived there. They had two services. They had the, an open service that they called the Bible study service, but most of us would kind of think of as the worship service. And I believe anyone could go there. And so the homosexuals could go there, receive the word, be loved, meet people, develop relationships, and hopefully have the Holy Spirit convict their hearts. But then there's the second part, the meeting of the church where they celebrate the Lord's Supper. And as a Baptist, I've been really thinking about this a lot and talking about it with my people. That needs to be a closed meeting where there's a testimony to the homosexual couple, let's say, and say, you can't, you can't come here until you repent. We want you here, but you can't come here until you repent. And that is just kind of like, it's not a hateful thing, I don't think. It's, it's, I'm sorry, this is a line we have to draw. And I wonder if we need to rethink the church in order to rethink discipline to more effectively reach these. I, I, asked, I, talked, some of the, uh, I talked to one of the leaders at my church about church discipline, and, and he had said in 40 years of ministry, he had, never, he had only seen church discipline exercise once, and it backfired, so they don't do that. And I said, I think, I really think we need to change that. <laughs> but it's hard to do it in the Baptist context. Um, so, affirm their salvation if they've believed in Jesus for eternal life. Love them, but speak the truth to them. Don't paper it over, I don't think. Same question. Same question. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, so that's the same question. Um, I, one, of my, one of my very good friends came out, and he got married. And as a, as a believer, I, had to, I struggled. 
I struggled for like several weeks. What do I do? This is kind of a shock to me. And what I found was he's still my friend. And everyone was hating on him. People, the people in his church turned on him and they, they sent him hate mail and hate emails and they tried to destroy his life. And it was a very work, kind of work salvation church that he came out of. And they just tried to destroy him. And I felt, he's my friend. And uh, he, knew, he knew where I stood, but uh, I committed myself. I'm still going to love him, and I'm going to get to know his husband. I'm still going to love his husband, and I'm still going to love his husband. And I'm going to be this open connection, an open kind of visible expression of grace in their life. Any other right. questions? That's it. Thank you for being easy.